It is not a joke. It is not a drill. It is already April Fool's Day. April has arrived. Welcome back. It's Wake Up with Damon and Larry. Great to see you. Larry, hope you had a good uh, Easter weekend. I did. I did. We went to my brother's. We had a, a nice, um, <clears throat> nice, you know, whatever you call lunch slash dinner. Uh, it was a good time. And uh, we're back here in the creek, ready to roll out some more content throughout the week. Looking forward to it. Well, look, man, it's going to be a big week because obviously draft month is officially here. It is April. Baseball's opening week has happened. We're in the final throws of an NBA regular season. We got ourselves a final four set. We got a Masters coming soon. And you blink twice, we're going to have a Summer Olympics. Like, we're about to buckle up and have a really good run on sports here. So welcome, everyone. It's great to have you here. Please hit like and subscribe. Larry and I are now bringing you Wake Up three days a week, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, starting around 8.30. And we're never going to waste your time. We're never going to drag you through a whole bunch of stuff you don't need. We want to get you in and out and make this show easy to fit into your daily schedule so larry as always we start with the 49ers and depending on whose column you're reading is how you know close to or further away from a deal the 49ers are with brandon Ayuk. it seems like this pendulum can't decide which way it wants to swing right now uh on friday i'm reading articles like hey it's getting closer it's actually going to be happening it seems to be both sides are cooling off and they want to get a deal done. And then you see like a Mike Garofalo piece saying, well, actually they're, they're further apart than you could imagine. And it's not going very smoothly. And I really don't know what or who to believe right now on the Brandon IU contract situation. Well, I mean, there's things that you can look at. I mean, Garofalo, you know, who he's got his sources and I'm sure the NFL network is good, you know, as far as, as far as their sources, I would never question their, uh, you know, their, media skill skills or anything else. But the thing that stuck out to me was that Ayuk is practicing at the facility or at least working out at the facility. If you were really in a heavily acrimonious situation where man, you didn't want to be there. They didn't want you there or that, you know, you wanted to be there, but they weren't throwing anything close to the dollar figure. And you didn't think it was getting done. Wouldn't you work out? somewhere else on your own instead he's there at the facility working out uh trying to get ready so i think iuk is all about winning championships i think he's really um very much a team oriented guy but he wants to get paid he wants to get broken off here um i think the niners are tough negotiators parag especially he's their chief negotiator and when they pick a number they stick to it and they've done some harsh things i mean we just saw it last week with offering Eric Armstead $6 million. I mean, that's just like a gigantic flip the bird, get the hell out of here kind of an offer. Uh, so I don't know how things are going, but my guess, if you said to me, make a guess on how this is going to go, I would guess that the Niners will sign IU to an extension. They will draft, you know, much higher than any of us expect a wide receiver. And then they will go through this year, and in the spring of next year, they will trade Debo Samuel for whatever they can get. And if it's a fifth, it's a fifth. If it's a fourth, it's a fourth. You know, whatever it's going to be. That would be my guess going into this year is that they re-sign Ayuk, draft a wide receiver, maybe a Malachi Corley, somebody who kind of fits the same description of a Debo. Maybe a Xavier Leggett, who's 230 pounds and even faster than Debo. But I think they'll draft some bulky, physical, dominating wide receiver and then trade Debo in the spring of 2025. Well, that conversation about Brandon Ayuk just turned into something different. Why is uh, well, Why do you think Debo is falling out of favor, if that's the way we're looking at this? I don't think he's falling in a favor. I just think that, you know, realistically, it's a hard cap and you can't, you can have $60 million tied up long term in wide receivers when you're trying to sign your quarterback for who had been playing for a million for 25 million. I just don't think the numbers work. I think Debo's body only probably has, if you ask me, I would say three years of really good football left and then a precipitous decline. I think they're aware of that. 
I think Shanahan loves Debo Samuel, but it's really just about, you know, you can't have everything in your in your cart as you're approaching uh, the checkout. You know, you got to have you got to you got to thin down the cart somehow, some way. They did it a little bit this year with uh, with uh, Armstead. They'll probably continue to do it with their offensive line by drafting guys and getting rid of the Jake Brendels of the world. Uh, but also I could see them doing it by lopping off Debo because he does make a, a sizable amount of money. I mean, let's be honest. If you're going to pay Brock 25 or 30 or 40 or 45, you know, which is kind of the neighborhood. Yeah. Somebody who's making, you know, 20 or 30, is going to have to probably come off the books, and that's probably going to be Debo. That would be my guess. So one of the things that you and I were talking about right before we came on was that Colin Cowherd is already, you know, going doom and gloom about how the 49ers will look once Brock Purdy is making a, a you know, attention-grabbing level of salary that normally comes with a starting NFL quarterback, that they'll be the brand-new Dallas Cowboys once again. And, you know, look, it's, it's, it's an easy talking point. It's a great little headline. Feels like you take two rivals, you attach them together, you piss off two fan bases all at once and blah, blah, blah. Like Cowherd's really good at what he does. But I don't think that that's a very good analogy at all because the Cowboys have no real postseason success to even point at and say, we did this. I don't think anyone would necessarily describe them as well-built and that is not a situation or world that the 49ers live in. A lot of people admire the way the 49ers have gone about building this team and this roster. And I just, I don't know, that feels like a little attention grabby, even for Colin Cowherd. But he is right. You know, keeping everything in the Ducks as you know them in a row will be impossible once Brock Purdy is in a $40 million figure. And that does bring us to then the, okay, tough choices on a guy like Debo Samuel. I mean, I think the cow, you know, to analyze the Niners and Cowboys that, you know, in, in that kind of a linear way, I think is, is, a, is laughable. The Niners have a workable working personnel department that doesn't include Jed or, you know, Parag just saying, Hey, we want that guy. That's where the Cowboys are at. That's where the, that's why the Cowboys are having problems. It's not, yeah, I mean, are the Niners going to have to be really good in their decision making? Absolutely. Are they going to have to hit on some day three guys? Yeah. Are they going to have to maybe hit on an undrafted guy? Sure. Is it going to be tougher to maintain a dominant roster with a tw- you know with a uh, twenty five or thirty five or forty five million dollar quarterback as opposed to a million dollar quarterback? Anybody could see that. But the Cowboys issues go so far beyond that. Right. And the Cowboys have, you know, Cowboys have credible scouts, but they're sitting there and Jerry and his son are making the final call. So, you know, I mean, and, and, and as you would expect, it's going the way you would expect it to go in that they hit on one Micah Parsons, then they miss on two Mozzie Smith and other guys. And they hit on one then they miss on two or three. And they hit on, you know, so I think their hit rate is far lower than the Niners. And I think that the Niners, if the Niners hit rate drops into the Dallas neighborhood where they're hitting on one of every four picks. Yeah. Then they're Dallas, but that's, that's going to make them Dallas more than Brock Purdy's contract. I think. Well, and the truth is, if you think Brock Purdy might be better than Dak Prescott, that's a, a game changer too. And I think, I think Dak Prescott is, you know, America's, favorite decent quarterback to just dump on. I guess that comes with the territory when you're the Dallas Cowboys quarterback. Hell, it comes with the territory when you're the Niners quarterback. You know, there are a few of these positions that even though they're all starting quarterbacks, they they do outrank one another. And 49ers starting quarterback, Cowboys starting quarterback comes with a, a whole lot more attention than Tennessee Titans starting quarterback, Houston Texans starting quarterback, uh, Las Vegas Raiders starting quarterback. It's just the way it is. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's always people trying to whip everyone into a frenzy about anything that could be happening about, you know, the 49ers who, again, you know, there's so much panic and talk about, well, all this that they need to do and they need to get much deeper and they need to do this and this free agency. Like you would think that this team was far away from a Super Bowl last year, right? I mean, based on all of the problems that some people want to say that this team needs to address in, in its off season. Look, you'd like to get a little bit deeper. You'd like to get a better right tackle. 
And outside of that, I mean, the, the list of needs isn't this laundry list, isn't a best buy receipt of all the stuff that the 49ers need. They were in overtime in the Super Bowl. They're pretty good as they come rolling into this year. And I know that the, the thumbnail today is talking about depth. Right. And we're talking about what you want to get deeper at. What position groups would you like to see fluffed in this upcoming draft? And there's a picture. What a Fred Warner right there. And and it kind of made me wonder because, you know, I, I'm pretty high on D Winters and Jalen Graham, Larry. And I know that you are, too. You know, isn't the the linebacker that you might think they need to draft to get deeper already on this team? But we just didn't see them much last year because they weren't played. Well, I mean, it, you know, I mean, I don't know. I mean, they, they, you know, I mean, so I, I loved what I saw from Jalen Graham in the preseason, but you know what? It would have been nice to have seen him play, I don't know, a down or two in the regular season. And I don't know what D Winters is. He shot gaps at TCU and looked good in the national semi, but I don't know. I don't know how good he is. So, um, you know, if those guys are awesome, yeah, then you don't need a linebacker. But if those guys are just, okay or if they're special teamers then you most certainly do because Greenlaw's out for the year and i don't know about the guy they signed from green bay and flanagan fouls is a special teamer so that's like that's part of the discussion it's like how how i love jalen graham i think he's terrific but um he didn't get on the field much last year so i would say that linebacker is still a need it's just not a primary need Corner, D-line, O-line, those are the three areas that stand out to me. Anything else feels like, now nah, you're just getting some frosting for that. A little frosting for the wide receiver room, a little frosting maybe for the running back room. Um, and this is a team that didn't you know, use an awful lot of the frosting that it had last year. I mean, Kyle and company, basically, they find a guy, they find a few guys that they want to play, and they just they play him to death. This isn't a team that has operated very deep in its depth chart beyond a rotating defensive line. Um, they do kind of stick with their starters throughout an entire game. I mean, I think there's areas on this team that, if you look closely, they do need help. I mean, obviously, right tackle. I mean, the future of your right side of your offensive line. Who's your future center? Do you have them? No. Do you, who's your future right guard? Do you have them? No. Who's your future right tackle? Do you have them? No. So I, I would say... The right side of the offensive line, from the center to the right, um, is is a is a you know primary need. Um, wide receiver only because you're in this weird financial situation with Debo and Ayuk and JJ and your cap and your quarterback. You know you could use a real dynamic wide receiver just simply because you can't afford to play, pay the guys you have. Uh, defensive tackle, if you could find just an absolute stalwart, would be great. One more edge rusher would be nice. A line, one more linebacker would be nice. To me, the the other big needs are they have a real severe need at safety. Um, I don't think people are really understanding how severe that need really is. Because I mean, if you look at their safety depth chart, you got a Fonga coming off an a, coming off an injury, and he was injured much of the time at SC. And then you have Jair Brown, who's probably more of a strong safety, but he's forced to play free safety. Then you have George Odom, who's a great special teamer, but nothing more. And then you have Eric Harris and Taylor Hawkins, who are, you know, good, great guys, but not, not starters. So you don't really have a young up and coming player at that position. And it's safety guys hurl their bodies around. There's all kinds of injuries. Um, this is a spot where you need depth and they have none. So I would say safety is a primary spot, even though we're not talking a lot about it. And then they have good depth at corner, but I think they're looking for that one dominant corner that could be paired with Lenore and with Mooney Ward uh, to really impact things. So I would say the secondary is a little bit more of a need than people think. Um, and that offensive line for sure. And then tight end. I mean, I don't think Cam Latu can play. Uh, as of today, he can't play. Uh, Braden Willis, as of today, I don't know that he's a, a, a you know starting NFL tight end. And then you have Jake Tungs from Cal. He's most definitely not a starting tight end. You lost Charlie Warner. You're probably going to lose Ross Dwelly. Kittle is 30, uh, going on 31. So uh, to me, 
tight end and safety are the two needs on this team that nobody really talks that much about because you've got Brown and Afonga and Kittle, but in reality, it's they're paper thin there, and they really need they need reinforcements. Well, like and subscribe, my good friends. We got you with all the Niners news that you need, and we do have a little Niner news over the weekend that is trying to address uh, that tight end room a little bit here. The 49ers have started the process of signing new tight end over the weekend. His name is Brock Wright. They have uh, offered a three-year, $12 million offer sheet that features $6 million in guaranteed money, and he is a Detroit Lion. The Lions did not have a second round tender on him. So to sign him would cost the 49ers no compensatory pick going back to Detroit. And Matt Mayoko has basically said the 49ers aren't trying to like, you know, gamesmanship a price point of a player for another team just to screw up another team's books. This is a player that they actually do want to go ahead and sign. This isn't one of those we dare you to match this Detroit type of offers, but uh, he's a golden domer. Uh, uh, Brock Wright played in 14 games last season, only one touchdown. He started 19 of 41 games. He's appeared in over his first three seasons, all with the Lions. But uh, there could be a, a name coming. Larry, Brock Wright, get your get your Brocks together. Brock to Brock connection. Um, what do you think of Brock Wright? I don't know much about him. I'm not going to pretend I'm an expert. Yeah, well, I mean, a couple things. Um, one that's no lock that he's a Niner. I mean, you know, it's, it's a price point. That's very reasonable. The Niners offered him a $2.98 million contract. Detroit has right of first refusal. They have until Wednesday to match. A lot of people feel like they're just going to match. Um, but they also have Sam Laporta and other needs and, um, a couple other tight ends on the roster. So maybe they, maybe they don't match as far as this player, you know, that it's interesting. It's like everybody looks at different stats and says, oh, you know, this is a blocker. But I don't know that this guy is an inline blocker. To me, this guy is more of a receiver. He went to high school in Cypress, Texas, went to Notre Dame, 48 games, 11 starts, only had the one touchdown there. But he also played H-back and fullback at Notre Dame. Um, he's 25. He's 6'5", 250. He's got 10-inch hands, which is great. 466 on the 40, which is is definitely passable. 26 reps of 225, which do, does tell you he probably is strong enough to be an inline blocker. Um, three years in Detroit, 36 receptions, six touchdowns. Kind of a lot of touchdowns, actually. Who are you, Larry? It's like you got everything but a centerfold in front of you right now. You, oh, you're, I know. You're, you're, you're well, I did a video on this last week. Ian Rappaport um, basically had the initial report and – um, the Niners will not offer, will not be owed a pick or will not owe Detroit a pick if right. Detroit does not match. So th it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a carefree offer. Um, you know, there's no, there's no harm. Uh, I like Notre Dame players for the most part, because I feel like they achieve to their talent level. Uh, this guy's a little stiff for sure. And, but he's got good size and he's got big hands and, um, you know, I, I, I think he could be a decent player. I mean, the Niners need to replace Dwelly. To me, Damon, the Niners need a veteran tight end. We talked about Robert Tanyan last week. Yep. Um, And maybe Brock Wright is that cheaper version of the veteran tight end. You know, a cheaper version of Tanyan. And then they need a, a, a big-time uh, tight end in the draft, or at least a tight end that they feel like can potentially be big-time. Um, so I think, you know, this makes sense. And I would I would expect them to sign a safety and a tight end before before uh, the drafts in what three weeks or so, so that that's kind of what I'm expecting. And um, and I don't know tons about this player. Nobody really does because he hasn't played a lot. But I do like the profile, the physical profile. I do like the cost. I do like the fact that you know he's the one thing about the Niner tight end position is you better be smart. Because it's you're, there's lots of shifts, lots of motions, lots of, yeah, you know, it's all this way except for this, 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 and that. You know what I mean? There's just a lot of variables that you got to crunch in a short amount of time. And I think that, it, more than anything, is the reason that Cam too has looked so bad. Is that I just think that he was overwhelmed mentally last summer. That's what, yeah, what I mean, he I was remember, facing. I remember as a training camp and 
you're just saying this guy's in his head. You can just see oh, the way yeah. he's like looking at his the tips of his cleats after every play. He's trying to remember something that he just didn't remember. Now he's got a coach yelling at him. And now he's got a player coaching him up. And it just it seemed too fast and too big. Well, and, and if you gave if you said, give me a list of four or five guys that were in camp last summer, but are going to be way, way, way better in camp this summer. I'm putting Latou at the top of that list because of this reason. He just looked overwhelmed. And once he now he's had a full season to learn the playbook, learn all the shifts, learn all the motions, learn all the special things that they're asking him to do. Um, and and I think he's going to I think he's going to fire. I, I think he'll I think Latou is going to be the one of the most improved players of the summer when they convene in July. Well, you were just saying that you didn't really believe, though. So, I mean, wouldn't no, but I mean, I, I logic tells me he's going to be hugely important. I don't believe in the level of he's your number two tight end going into camp and you don't need somebody else. Like, I don't think Jake Tongues and Braden Willis are necessarily the guys. Uh, Willis seems to me to be like the wrong body type for tight end. Tongues is not an NFL uh, you know, starter in my opinion. So they need, you know, they need a, a veteran tight end and they also could use um, a rookie tight end with some upside. Maybe the two is that veteran tight or that rookie tight end with upside uh, just one year delayed. But I, I like the two, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't put my, I wouldn't bet my season on it. Well, you know, I, I really believe in, in players getting better an improvement in off seasons playing, you know, vital roles in any team's projections. And when you just asked me like, what, what is the most important thing for the 49ers right now? Nailing draft picks or just Brock Purdy having that off season that brings him even a bigger step forward than he was in year two. Like that right there, Brock Purdy having a massive off season, I think is a good way to get over some of the, the, you know, the, the blocking concerns that you might've had in front of him, just a speedier, more athletic, more ready to go, not being surprised by anything. Brock Purdy is a more dangerous 49er team just right there. You know, there's an awful lot of improvement that you'd like to see along this offensive line to me, Spencer Burford, just busting his rump going into year three here is probably going to be a better football player than anyone that they just draft and hope to throw in there unless you really do ring that bell and you you know you found a nice big pile of money late in that first round and you do have a ready to play day one offensive lineman which is a tough thing in this league it really is so um you know I I know that you and I have you know in past philosophical arguments with other content creators about Brock Purdy. Just, you know, they didn't leave any room for improvement. I am. I'm leaving room for improvement for a lot of these guys, including Colton McKivitt, Spencer Burford, and the you know players du jour that fans love to sit around and say aren't good enough, yet in their efforts last year, had them a heartbeat away from a Super Bowl. So they're not, even if they're bad, they ain't that bad based on what we just saw. Well, I mean, this is a perfect opportunity to build your, build, you know, your fortress for Brock Purdy to support your quarterback. I mean, teams do this all the time. They take Trevor Lawrence and then they take a wide receiver or an offensive tackle, or they take a top tier, you know, player or two or top tier quarterback. They find their guy and then they support him. Well, whether it was the first pick or the last pick, um, there's no question. I mean, you're you're you have to support this guy. How do you best support Brock Purdy? I think you best support him by finding another receiver who can, you know, another another weapon, receiver or running back that can be dynamic in the short range, whether it be a running back or a tight end or a, a, a receiver that catches short and runs long, and then. And then build him a fortress offensive line wise. I mean, he's operating behind a street free agent center, uh, street free agent, you know, veteran free agent. Anybody could have had him guard in Feliciano. If you're going with Burford, he's a fourth round pick. If you're going with McKivitz, he's a fifth round pick. I mean, build out your build out your line. I mean, I think they just if you said number one thing, 
get more help on the line of scrimmage, both sides of the ball. Uh, you know, you gotta, you gotta find a, a, a good edge rusher. You gotta find a good tackle on defense, on offense. You gotta find a center, a guard and a tackle that you really believe of the future. And, um, if you do that, man, the Niners are going to be sitting chilly for, you know, the next five years, because you're right. Their quarterback is going to get better. And, um, how's he going to get better? He's going to get better because he's going to, his body's going to get stronger. He's going to get quicker, faster, more sudden, more explosive, more knowledgeable. All those things benefit, uh, Purdy, but it's time to kind of build the, build the thing up around Brock. Like many, many teams do. Like, subscribe, notify, memberships available, Damon Bruce Plus, The Krug Show. Thank you so much for watching this morning. We really appreciate it. Uh, obviously, you're about to get into uh, one of your, your happy spots, Larry. I know you love the NFL draft probably as much as anybody out there. And we, as we get closer and closer, I'm sure, are going to continue to zero in and zero in without getting too granular. What are you thinking about in this draft right now? Where is your attention as you're looking for second day two, maybe day three draft picks? Uh, just a little thumbnail sketch before we kind of look back at baseball's opening weekend and a uh, pretty decent weekend for the NCAA tournament. So uh, just final thoughts on the Niners as we kind of had a slow news week for them. Well, I mean, now I start to go and look real close at the guys that they have brought in and potential sleepers. And by the way, so just so everybody knows, the Niners have a first round pick. They have a second round pick. They have a third round pick. They have three picks in the fourth round. One for Trey Lance, one is a comp pick, and one is their own. So they have not three, two, two, not multiple twos. Um, a one, a two, a three, three fours, a five, two sixes, and a seven. I was just looking at a couple of their guys this weekend. Uh, that they brought in for visits that are really kind of impressive when you watch them. One is a uh, safety slash linebacker, Jamal Hill from Oregon. Damon, you got to go watch this guy. I'm going to do a video on this guy today. I mean, this guy's a thumper. I mean, this guy's a hitter. Uh, I don't know if he's a linebacker, an undersized linebacker, if he's a special team linebacker, or if he's, you know, going to grow into linebacker, or if he's going to, potentially be able to play strong safety in this defense. But Jamal Hill from Oregon is just a monster. And they brought him in, and I'm looking at where he's ranked, and he's not ranked very high as far as, like, this may be a day three pick. This may be a – definitely will be a day three pick, but, I mean, it might be an undrafted guy. Uh, but Jamal Hill, really, really impressive to me. The other – the other guy that I watched this weekend that I really liked is Javon Baker, who's a wide receiver from Central Florida. Uh, Javon Baker, I guess, was at the Big 12 Pro Day, and they visited with him, and he's impressive. I mean, you're talking about doesn't run an incredible 40 times, so maybe the scouts are going to miss him. We're like a 4-5-4, but um, middle of the draft, I mean, Javon Baker could be a very, very good get as a receiver i mean the guy runs routes he's got hands he's got ability to kind of run away so that guy really stood out and then um the other guy is sioni vaki uh safety from utah i said before the niners are going to be looking for safeties and they met with vaki and vaki is like a part-time safety part-time running back um and he's just really an intriguing football player i mean he's just a very active he's you can tell he's a he's a playmaker um sounds like play someone who could help with like new hybrid kickoffs and whatnot yeah i mean there's there and then you kind of wonder about that whole thing you know the the rule changes like is you know the the niners sent a big contingent to western kentucky to watch malachi corley well corley's thought to be a second or third round pick but in a lot of ways if you factor in these new new rules he might be a ideal guy to have so those those are the guys that kind of I've, I've been standing out standing out to me. I mean, really, this this Oregon kid Jamal Hill. Just from when you watch him, you're like, whoa, this guy is a big time hitter. This guy can move. Um, there's some nasty there. Uh, I, I love me some Jamal Hill, and I'm just kind of wondering, you know, now it's like, okay, the Niners always are good on day three of the draft, and they're always good after the draft. 
are they targeting a couple of these guys after the draft? Um, I think it's going to be, it's going to be a fun month to watch because they always, you know, any scouting department is going to find some, some, some diamond in the rough that they love. And a lot of times they want to meet with those guys, get a closer look. Uh, and Jamal Hill from Oregon might be on the top of that list. All right. So everyone's got a homework assignment. Jamal Hill, get your film study up and be ready. We will, uh, We'll, we'll see everyone turn in their assignment on Wednesday morning at 8.30 when Larry and I are back at it again here on Wake Up. So couldn't help but notice the Bay Area's long list of failed high-priority draft picks gets another name added to it, Larry. Obviously, the Warriors with James Wiseman, Trey Lance with the San Francisco 49ers did not work out, but at least those players upon their departure, returned something. Joey Bart washes out of the San Francisco Giants organization with a return of absolutely nothing. They didn't have the foresight to basically look at this guy, evaluate it ain't going to be him, and then use him as a sweetener, as a trade sprinkle. Even though it hasn't been a success, he still had name value being the second overall pick of the 2018 draft. And they didn't even figure out a way to get a little value out of him on the way out the door. He gets DFA'd so Dalton Jeffries can get a start in San Diego that was just awful. I mean, just he couldn't have had a worse outing in three innings. He gave up nine runs, for goodness sakes. And uh, the fact that Joey Bart had to die so we could see a, a game of Dalton Jeffries is just kind of the status of the, the Giants farm system in a little snapshot of it, don't you think? Well, it's, 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 um, it's revealing. It shows the way prospects are treated when, um, they're not your guy. I mean, Bart was a Sabian guy. Um, I guarantee you, you know, uh, Farhan would trade his, would, would treat his own guy a little bit differently. He's eligible to be traded for the next week. So, um, he still could be traded. It's not for sure that he'll be waived. I, I think personally he will be traded, to be honest, Damon. Why? Because because he's a catcher, and there's just it's hard to find catchers. Right. And it's there's hard some to find, value there. There's something yeah, there's, there. There's some value. I would if you said to me, what do you think's gonna happen? I think he's gonna get traded. I think he's gonna get traded to the A's. Um, I think he'll be an Oakland A, that or Vegas A or whatever you want to call the A's. He'll be an A. Um if the Giants can't find a trade partner, he could be he would be placed on unconditional release waivers, uh, and then he's on, he's a absolute lock to be claimed off waivers. Um, somebody's going to claim him off waivers. Why? Because sure. he's twenty seven. He's got bat speed. He was the second pick in the draft. Um, the guy's his catch and throw is very impressive. He doesn't have any options remaining, so he can't be sent to the minors without be, being placed on waivers again. Um, you know, he in a, he was texting, I guess he said, just wish the best for my teammates and excited for a new opportunity. So, you know, I've talked to him before. He's a good kid. Um, I, I kind of wonder about his focus. He doesn't Why, have an awful lot of people telling you how much of a hard worker he is. That's for sure. Well, I, I, I'm more, I question kind of the focus of the player because um, I've seen him crossed up at least a half dozen times, you know. You'd see Buster Posey crossed up like once or twice, excuse me, once or twice a year. Um, this guy's getting crossed up like once or twice a game. So I kind of wonder, is he, is he, does he forget? Does he, does he call the pitch and forget it? Does he, you know, is his mind in a different spot? Uh, some of his receive, some of his, his um, framing looks kind of rough to me. I don't love the way he sits on the one knee. Um, you know, I mean, it's this guy's at the same time. I'm not at all confident to say that. Oh, yeah, he's a bust. I've seen a lot of Giants fans in a lot of these chats going, oh, Bart's a bust. He sucks. All right, let's move on from him. No, you're an idiot and you don't know baseball. And Matt Williams it came up in 80, 80. He was an 86 draft choice. He was in the majors in 87. And then he, but he actually wasn't a full major leaguer and really rolling until like 94. So, I mean, it takes time. It's a really hard game. 
takes time to bust through. You're not, you don't just bust through and all of a sudden you're just badass. It's like, you know, some guys can do that, but not everybody. So this guy's been up, he's been down, he's been up, he's been down. We've seen some improvements. Uh, the bottom line is we're always told about his improvements and then he strikes out at a really high rate. And right. You just can't do that. You can't strike out at a really high rate. Now, Melvin is a former catcher. So, um, you know, maybe he he has a better evaluation of Bart. Um, but, he, you know, Bart was the final first round pick of of the last regime. And Bailey was was the first first round pick of the new regime. If Bailey were struggling this this like this, would Farhan jettison him as quick? I would say not. I would say not. I would say Bar- Farhan's going to be far more protective over Bailey. But Bailey's shown more. Yeah, Bailey's point. an actual... He's already had twice the career of, of Joey Bart behind the plate and just at the plate, too. So, I um, look, you know, so, sometimes it doesn't work out. But just to have that much value in hoopla put into a player, fast track him, kind of put him in a bad situation because Posey exits stage left a year earlier than you thought he would. And it just it, uh, like, you know, the pandemic and just a confluence of not working out with really many of the prospects that are coming through the giant system. I mean, it's their, their farm system is the problem more than any ability to sign a free agent or anything. Their farm system has been the big letdown of the Farhan era so far. There's no doubt about it. And obviously Joey Bart looking like he's going to exit stage left here is not going to be another feather in the cap of high value draft picks here in the Bay area, which there have been some massive swings and misses on. Um, I will say this, you know, they split a season uh, opening series down in San Diego. Uh, Jung Hoo Lee hits his first major league home run in front of his dad. That was cool. He looks a, a little, a little more hitterish than maybe we had feared there. Larry, he looks okay. Matt Chapman has started the year off, right? Already got six RBI Conforto's hitting 400 with a, a couple of bombs. So there is some life in the giants lineup, but man, thank God that they signed Blake Snell. We haven't even seen him yet, but they're already like not even one turn through their rotation, having to get an emergency start out of Dalton Jeffries. And like they, t- to be this, kind of like you know figuring out your rotation before you've even gone through your rotation once like thank god that they signed blake snell because they seem thin in that regard even with him well i mean they've got a lot of pitchers coming though you got alex cobb you got robbie ray you got carson wisenhunt just had a really nice uh three inning shutout performance with a bunch of k's and the minors he's nasty i mean i i think starting pitching wise the giants actually look okay I mean, Jeffrey's got hit around for sure, but the Padres were going to fire uh, on Sunday. You know, the Gi- nice opening weekend. I think let's just not overreact to the, right. to an opening weekend. You know I mean? It's like the Giants split a series in San Diego. Good for them. Um, Bailey, to me, you know, looked good. Tom Murphy's bat looks live. Uh, Nick Ahmed, I think they made the right call on – you know, between Crawford and Nick Ahmed, I think they he made the right it. call. I'll tell you, he's, he makes some nice plays out there early on. Yeah, I mean, and he looks healthier than Crawford, and his body looks a little younger than Crawford. Chapman, if he hits, is going to be a phenomenal player because he's just an instructional video on how to play how to play third base. Flores went flying into the dugout yesterday, so we don't know what his situation is for tonight or going forward. Um, but he looked like he was in a lot of pain and then Conforto, I mean, Conforto's ripping. I mean, so right now Conforto looks amazing to me. Jorge Soler is yet to wake up as far as Jung Hu Lee, you know, I thought yesterday might've been his best, most impressive game from the standpoint of, you know, three walks. I mean, the, the guy knows the zone and that's the thing that when, it, when you watch him, you're like, wow. This guy really commands the strike zone. Now, all these people jumping up and down, yelling, Krug, you're, you know, you're, 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 you hated him and you're, I'm waiting for you to backtrack. It's like, dude, r- go look at what I said. What you I said, Jung Hoo Lee, an apology, Larry. <laughs> yeah. Look what I actually said, which is they're paying him 
fifteen million dollars a year. The Giants are paying Jung Hoo Lee what the Astros are paying Jordan Alvarez. The Giants are paying Jung Hoo Lee what the what the D backs are paying Corbin Carroll. Um, all I'm saying is nineteen million dollars a year for a guy coming out of the KBO is a major risk. That is. That's a major risk. They're paying him huge, huge money. Now, opening weekend, uh, there were several things I liked about him. I like the way he tracks balls in the outfield. I like the way he takes pitches. Um, I like the way, you know, he's got a he puts everything into his into his into his swing. You know, I asked Marty Lurie at the a couple of weeks ago, I said, what do you think this kid's gonna hit? Because in my mind, if you're paying them 19 million, he's got to hit like 285, 290, which is where he's at right now. He's hitting 286 with the home run. Um, and Marty's like, yeah, I think he's going to hit 255. Now, Marty, I did hear this weekend say, you know, oh, I'm very impressed by Jung Hoo. So maybe, so maybe Marty, uh, you know, you know, thinks it's going to be higher. But well, and here's the thing: if this kid hits two sixty-five, well, forget two fifty-five. Let's say he hits two sixty-five, two seventy-five. That's not worth nineteen million dollars a year. No, but two, Larry, two, two sixty is the new two eighty-five. I mean, it really is. I guess around the baseball, it really is. So, um, I don't know if that's a compliment or an excuse, but it it, it really. I mean, just batting averages ain't what they used to be when we were kids. We know that. I mean, there's, there's several things to like. I mean, he, he's, he knows the strike zone. Um, I don't know how many bases he's going to steal, but he seems to have a confidence about him. That's, that's really great. And I'm sure he does. He was the MVP of his league last year. Why would he not come in confident, but let's just all pump the brakes on Jung Hoo Lee, you know, saying Jung Hoo Lee is this or that. Let's just pump the brakes and yeah, see nice what start. it looks like. I would say, you need at least six weeks touch base with me. It's May. It's April 1st, you know, in, in, on May 15th, on May 15th, let's take a look at where Jung Huli is and make an evaluation. Uh, I need for, for nine, for, for six years guaranteed at, at, you know, where he's, he's making huge bucks. He's making 19 million a year for six years guaranteed. I need a guy who can play center field, lead off, hit about 290, and and score a ton of runs and be the ignition. If he's that guy, awesome. And I'm a hardcore Giants fan. I want to see them. I want to see him succeed. I'm rooting for my my opinion to to be wrong because I'm more of a Giants fan than I care about, you know, being right. I don't need to be right. I I, I want to see the team win. And anybody who knows me knows that. So We'll see. So far, so good. Opening weekend, um, I thought he had a presence about him, and I, I, I liked what I saw at the plate. Um, most specifically, man, the guy, you can throw a pitch like right off the corner, and he just doesn't even doesn't even flinch. He's just like, yeah, fine. There you go. I'm taking that. Get some plate discipline. It looks like he's got a little bit of it. Again, decent opening weekend in uh in San Diego, and now it's Giants and Dodgers that gets going tonight from Chavez Ravine. So we'll take a look at that. And look, you know, it's 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 way too early in the baseball year to try to define anyone. We haven't seen enough. And we're way too late in a basketball season to still not know an awful lot about a team. But I feel that this is where we are on the Golden State Warriors because they really are. Larry, they're a freaking adventure. One day they look like they're ready to just tap out and walk away from any notion of competition this season. And then in other games, you get a war daddy Draymond Green level effort that makes you start saying things like, huh, you know, they could maybe, you know, upset somebody here in the first round. Or I mean, it just, it depends on what warrior you, you see. And, you know, they just beat a depleted uh, San Antonio team last night that was missing about 50 points from its lineup. But, you know, it was still a, Still a win on the road for the Warriors, and you can't complain about those anymore. Just getting wins is all they're looking for. And, you know, they are now six games over 500 with a 4-1 and one road trip that they just had. Draymond was fantastic in San Antonio. Curry, he had 33. They're two games up on Houston, thanks to Luka and the Mavs, who beat the surging Rockets on Sunday. And now the next three games are, are huge for the Warriors. They've got Luka and the Mavs on Tuesday night. 
then they're at Houston, then at the Mavericks again. So they've got, you know, a couple of pretty good teams in front of them, one team that they're trying to hold off. Um, this is going to be an interesting weekend of, or uh, an interesting week for the Golden State Warriors. It really will be. I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not here to predict what this week is going to mean to their playoff, you know, chances, but they, they got to get through this week pretty darn well to have playoff chances. So it's a big week. Well, it's taken Kerr all season to figure out who's good on his team and who's not. You know what I mean? It's like, I love Steve. He's a great guy. But, I mean, should it really have taken you till April to figure out that Trace Jackson Davis was better than Looney? Should it really have taken you to April to know that Moses Moody deserves minutes? The right. Warriors need Moses Moody to give them double-digit scoring off the bench. He got 10 off the bench last night. They won by four. Um, you know, Pajemski's their best player as far as plus minus. He's got to play off the bench. And then you got Paul, you got Peyton, you got Looney. You can work those veterans in, but go with Trace Jackson Davis over Looney. And finally, Steve is doing that nine minutes for Looney, 28 last yesterday for, for, uh, Trace Jackson Davis. I mean, Trace Jackson Davis gives you so much more seven points, seven rebounds, three assists, two steals. He had a block. Draymond, I don't know what to say about Draymond. It's like he plays, sometimes he plays, and he looks like the Draymond of old, and he you know, looks like they could beat anybody in the playoffs, and then he then he looks disinterested, then he gets himself kicked out. Then he, you know, but yesterday, you're right. I mean, 21 points, 11, six rebounds, 11 assists, six steals. 11 assists and six steals and a block. So, yeah, he was plus 13. He looked great. So, um I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I don't do, do I mean, I hate to be like, this is much ado about nothing because it's like, it's, it sounds so, you know, dismissive of the whole season, but in reality, I mean, the warriors what's happening here. I mean, you know what I mean? What, what, what are we, what are we really talking about? Uh, they're not, they're going to get uh, the one seed or the two seed and they're going to get flushed. Um, but, you know, I mean, I, 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 it's been a challenging year. It's been a really weird them. year, man. It's, it's a it's weird, weird year because Kurt doesn't know who to play. He was like, well, am I loyal to my old guys or am I, do I play the best players? And then, well, you know, my younger guys are playing well. Do I play them? But then there's bumps in the road for all I, younger players. I mean, it's just to serve very, two masters. Neither master got served. Right. Right. So it's like this, just the whole year has been this weird gray area of sort of stuck in between what you once were and what you might be. And it's, it's weird. And then you just get Pajemski, right? Like Pajemski is such a weird player because anyone with a minuscule amount of basketball knowledge can tell, Hey, this kid is like an all court basketball player. He's really good at a lot of things. I don't know if he's great at anything beyond rebounding for his size, but he is, he makes lineups better, but he's not necessarily a floor general. He's certainly not a shooter yet. Uh, he is not an A plus defender, but he defends pretty well. Like he's just, he's in the middle of a whole bunch of being good at this or not good. I mean, it's, it's weird. This, this whole team is in the middle. The whole year has been in the middle. They're the middling Golden State Warriors. I love Pajemski. He knows how to play. He rebounds consistently, but like, is he a one? Hmm. Is he kind of an undersized two? Um, he's your first he, guard off the bench. Like that's who he should be. Yeah. He's, he's a bench player. He's not a starter. He's a bench player and he's a good one. What I love about him is he knows how to play and he makes other guys better the moment's not too big for him. He's not like, oh, my God, you know, I can't be out here with these guys. He plays with poise. Uh, he plays with smarts. He makes the right basketball play. He had seven rebounds in 24 minutes last night you know, or yesterday. 12 points, seven rebounds in 24 minutes for pods. So he's, he's he's been good. I mean, I mean, heck, if you gave the Warriors what they had, which was wasn't he like the 18th pick and Trace Jackson Davis was the 57th pick. Mm -hmm. okay, you got 18 and you got 57 and you're going into the draft and you come away with pods, Pajemski and trace Jackson Davis. You've done a really good job. Yeah. So, I mean, they did an exceptional job of maximizing 
those uh, draft choices. Now it's just a matter of what are you going to do? Is there a move that can be made that gets Golden State into the championship discussion again? Because they're really not. And um, they're, you know, they're with their sub 500 at home and, and they're, they're, they're just, you know, it's Steph and the Stephettes at this point. It's right. Like, the, uh, or, or do you want that or do you want, you know, potentially to, you know, run for a title? And I know that they want to run for a title, but it's a matter of is there a move or moves out there this summer or this springtime that give you uh, a chance? I just think the Warriors get into this offseason and they look at it like this. It's Steph Curry, Jonathan Kaminga, Trace Jackson Davis, Brandon Pajemski, Moses Moody. Those are your untouchables. Everyone else is up for grabs. Anything. If you got, sorry, Draymond, sorry, Clay, this loyalty to the three of you guys crossing the finish line together is probably the wrong place to put the hopes and dreams of this franchise. And if a tough choice needs to be made in order to get better, this is the off season in which they need to do it, or they will have wasted the end of, of what this is for Curry. And they got something with Kaminga, man. I mean, he's, he, th- this kid's for real. And Trace Jackson Davis is going to be much better next year. And if Pajemski's much better, and if, if Moody keeps on coming, th- there's something here, but how to squeeze the last bit out of it is. Well, we know exactly what they need to do. They need to somehow figure out a way to find somebody who wants Chris Paul's expiring monster contract and get the hell off of Wiggins. I mean, look at Wiggins yesterday. Wiggins was a circus two of 12 from the field. He played 22 minutes, four points, five rebounds, no assists. He's just like, it's like, he. I feel like Wiggins treats some of these NBA regular season games like, like he's just like on the treadmill. Like, ah, I'll just I'll get my workout, get my leg, get my run he's in. Not, Larry, he's my least favorite player to watch in the NBA because we know how good he is. And then you see him not being that good more often than you even see him trying. I can't stand Andrew Wiggins. I can't stand him. If I never He's watched just, him play another game, I'd be good with it. His his nickname should be Coasts because that's what he does. He just coasts. He's got he's made millions and millions of dollars. And what does he want to win? Yeah, he wants to win. Does he no, live no, to no, win? No, 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 no. no I don't know. He, he does Yeah, he I think he's 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 down for whatever. <laughs> you know. But do you really want to win tonight? Sure. You know, that's about as the, the, the man just, I, I, I just don't like Andrew Wiggins. Anyway, let's wrap up with this. As I see, we don't have many super chatting. That's all right. Uh, we'll, we'll accept the generosities and, and, and tithing of paychecks a little bit later on as we get closer to the draft. But thank you very much. We do have dumpster Dan, dumpster, dumpster Dan, dumpster Dan, dumpster fire. Dan says wide receiver is best player available at 31. Who you take McConkey is my guy. Um, I'm not taking a wide receiver. Number one, I'm not, I'm not taking a wide receiver at 31. If I'm the Niners, I could take a wide receiver at 31, but I'm not taking McConkey. McConkey had two touchdowns Two. like there's two people on this show. There's like two touchdowns for McConkey. So I don't, yeah, he ran a great 40 time. Yeah. He's made some nice plays. Um, there's some nice things to like there, but second overall for McConkey with two touchdowns. No, I need more. I need more there there to be before I'm like, yeah, you know what? I'm, I'm all in as far as wide receiver. Um, I mean, Marvin Harrison's going top five. Malik neighbors is going top 10. Roma Dunze is probably going top 10 top as 15. well. Um, I like Brian Thomas, the LSU kid who's six, three, two Oh nine had 17 touchdowns. So your guy had two. My guy that I like had 17. That's a, that's, that's quite 15 a bit better. more, Larry. I've done the math on this. That's 15 more touchdowns, 15 more, 15 more. But I, but then like, I, I think there's a bust uh, category in this wide receiver class. Like McConkey, I really like, but I like him, you know, as a second or third round pick and he's going to get overdrafted based on his 40 time. Troy Franklin from Oregon, a eh, little lean. Adane Mitchell, I like a lot from Texas. Xavier Worthy is a speedster, but I don't love him. Um, to me, it, it would have to be, I don't know that I see a, 
I guess I guess I would say my first round wide receivers, if there were, you know, there are three guys that I would look at in the first round at wide receiver. Brian Thomas, if he falls, and then if you wanted to, you know, reach a little for Xavier Leggett, he's 6'3", 230. Uh, he had a tremendous year at South Carolina. He's more of a one-year guy, though, I'll be honest there. And then Malachi Corley, who's got some special traits uh, from Western Kentucky. I think those are the three receivers, Corley, Leggett, and um, and Brian Thomas Jr. If those guys are available at the end of the first round, you might consider it. But I, to me, it's an offensive line type draft or a defensive line type draft at 31. Give me the best defensive tackle. Give me the best offensive tackle, um, you know, or center or guard. Uh, the guy that I'm certain to really, really like a lot is is the center from um, West Virginia. Uh, just from the standpoint of, I mean, this is a good center draft too. There's Jackson Powers Johnson. There's Graham Barton. But I like Zach Frazier from West Virginia. When I watch his film, it's just like, you got to be kidding me. He's like, burying guys into the turf and he could be a he could be a plug and play impact center uh if there is such a thing out of west virginia so you know that's that's my thought but yeah there's if, if you're going wide receiver brian thomas xavier Leggett, malachi corley in round one um here's a question from blood moon you guys gonna go live during the draft that's actually a uh that's, that's a good know. question larry what are we gonna do I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do during the draft because uh, last year I just absolutely dominated with all kinds of videos during the draft. So I may go live at portions of 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 uh, the draft, maybe day one, maybe round three. But I also will probably peel off of whatever live I'm doing to to do like info videos on who the Niners just took and that kind of thing. So we'll do we'll be doing a we'll just bank on this we'll be doing a lot on draft it's match weekend. it's a mix and match yeah we'll be doing a lot on draft weekend and then mark graves says is if iuke is not signed by draft day and they pick a wide receiver at 31 do they trade him um they've said that they're gonna only listen to offers through the end of the first round and then they're not listening to offers i as i said mark if you heard the beginning of the show i really think that the play here is going to be draft. Don't, don't, you know, maybe you don't get Ayuk uh, signed before the draft, but then go and draft a receiver higher uh, than you think and then sign Ayuk and trade Debo next, next, you know, April or next March. That would be my guess. Larry, our final four is set. Uh, Purdue has made it. It's never going to sit right with me, but they, they've they been pretty dominant and they deserve it. So congrats to the Purdue Boilermakers. I have no jokes for you today. NC State is in the Final Four as an 11 seed. They're first since 83, where Valvano was running around the court looking for somebody to hug. Uh, they bounced Duke to get there, so that's always a big deal for an ACC team. Alabama reaches its first Final Four ever, and UConn has just been blowing teams off the court for two straight NCAA tournaments right now. And Larry, if UConn wins a championship again this year, I think they are the newest entry into the phrase blue blood that we've seen. Normally, for to be a blue blood, you have to have started from days of grainy black and white footage. Um, they are a team that, is, with its modern work, has entered the conversation of blue blood. And with a championship, I you know UConn has surpassed Indiana as uh, as an elite college program. It breaks my heart to say that, uh, but it's it's the, the absolute truth. Indiana's been pretty irrelevant for twenty years, and UConn's been winning championships. Yeah, I mean the Connecticut's doing it this year with a different cast. It's amazing, Tristan Newton and these guys, and um yeah clinging the big man donovan Klingon, seven oh my God, two. Dude, the entry passes that he was getting they just entry passing to just layups for him i mean it was i had coach i had yeah i had connecticut and bama creighton and who was my fourth team um but I'll tell you the the, the big man battle between Edie and Klingon could be fun to watch yeah, I had Creighton, Bama, UConn, and Houston 
So I got two of my final four. I had 14 of the 16 Sweet 16. It was one of the best brackets I've ever done. I, I'll say this. I was very surprised that Creighton went down. I was very surprised that Purdue got by Gonzaga. I thought the Zags were going to beat them at halftime of that game, and Purdue just boat raced them in the second half. So, I mean, Edie is on a mission. Um Alabama, though, is an amazing pl- team. I, I, I think Alabama is really well coached. If you said, is there a team, what do you think of, you know, I, I think it, that Alabama-UConn game might be the best. That might be the national championship in the semi. Um, I really like what I see out of Bama. I mean, you know, if you watch Alabama so far, they're they they they're playing well. I mean, they got well, a bunch of guys. You, my favorite that, player in this tournament, who I'm going to remember the most, is DJ Burns, the the center from North Carolina State. I mean, this guy, he's just a big boy out there. Looks like he, you know, he steals somebody's lunchables when they're not looking. He's carrying 30 extra pounds, and I think he might just have the right body to put it on Edie and make him uncomfortable in that national semifinal. I think that is going to be maybe the best single remaining matchup in the final four. Um, so it's look, you got to defend Mark Sears though. And, and Mark Sears yeah. has just been absolutely amazing. Um, you know, if you look at what he's been able to do in this tournament, I mean, 23 against Clemson, uh, 18 against Carolina, he had 26, 12 rebounds and six assists against, uh, Grand Canyon university. Uh, which was an amazing game, by the way. That that was an amazing game, uh, <laughs> Grand Canyon, Alabama. But Alabama's just getting it done, man. Alabama, I think they're well coached. They got a they got a number of guys who are stepping up. Uh, I do expect UConn to beat Bama, though. I think that's probably what's going to happen. And then uh, I would probably take uh, Purdue. I'd probably take the the two ones, UConn and Purdue, national championship on on Monday night. And then uh, I'll be rooting man for against UConn like I cash tuition checks in stores, Connecticut. Let's go UConn if that needs to happen. But uh, uh, look, it's it's been a wildly unforgettable NCAA turn. There's not a single all-time memory that this tournament has borne for us yet. Not one. Not one. There have been a couple of good games and overtime games, but there's not a single tingle goes up your spine forever talking about it memory from this NCAA tournament yet. And then, you know, over on the women's side of the bracket, I'm just telling you right now, like I'm just, I'm so tired of LSU. It's coach. It's on, it's just, they just, I'm, t- I'm, I'm ready for that storyline to be over with like Caitlin Clark. She can shoot it. I get it. Let's get this game out of the way. And just enough, enough LSU, Caitlin Clark, blah, 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 blah. Like, okay, we get it. It's enough. I mean, I don't even know of what you speak. I mean, you know, this women's tournament is a rumor to me. I've never watched. I never have watched. I never will watch. It's just, I I watch sporting events uh, that I enjoy and I watch sporting events for athleticism. And I like, if I wanted to watch an under the rim game, I could watch high school ball. So I just, I'm not, I'm, I'm not against the ladies. I've got a daughter. I'm, you know, God bless her and God bless their tournament. I just, I can't say anything about it because I just you don't see watch the, it. They didn't even get the three point lines right up in Portland. They didn't lay the court down right enough for them. Like, come on, no. that's get that right. Get that right. Anyway, you're going to want to get these three point lines, right? I mean, the women deserve this too, Tommy. You'd never see anything like this in the men's tournament. They would have measured these things. They would have measured twice and cut once. And these ladies deserve a little bit better, but I'm going to tell you right now, I don't like that LSU coach. I, she's a little, she's a little, uh, a terse. If you don't mind me saying, you know what I really love about the tournament is it gives me chances to watch more film on guys who have torn their ACL. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I, I like it. I'm in, I'm out. Uh, it's a quick hitter for me, Damon and Lowry. And I'll tell you, uh, you know, I, I've seen some people here that would be very underrated by scouts if they just blew out an ACL or a quad, maybe an Achilles. Uh, but, you know, good old Trent Bulk, he's getting ready for the draft. And I'll tell you right now, uh, I've talked to Coach Peterson. I ran out my entire defensive staff because I couldn't take any blame. But I'll tell you, 
watch out for the Jags, okay? We got Eric Armstead, and we're coming. We're coming. <laughs> All right, and I just want everybody to know, uh, Eric Armstead is a Jaguar, damn it, and he's a Jaguar because of this guy right here, Trent freaking Balky. <laughs> 